Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Fall Risk Reduction. We appreciate you being here. These monthly complimentary webinars are brought to you through a partnership with O'Connor Mortuary, Care Choices, Hospice, and Palliative Services, and Alzheimer's Orange County. And my name is Kim Bailey of Alzheimer's Orange County, and I'll be your host today. We provide these monthly webinars as a service uh, to the senior community, and we are offering topics of interest to anyone working with seniors uh, or folks with memory loss, et cetera. And we're so pleased uh, to have Carol Dupay with us today. She's a wonderful speaker, and she'll be talking, of course, about uh, fall risk reduction. It's time for me to introduce our speaker. Uh, her name is Carol Dupay, and she is the Clinical Supervisor of Senior Services at St. Jude Medical Center in Fullerton, where she oversees community outreach programs for seniors, including a medical transportation program, caring neighbors, fall risk assessments, depression counseling programs, insurance planning, bereavement support groups, classes on healthy living with chronic conditions, and much, much more. Ms. DePay also hosts the North Orange County Senior Collaborative. She facilitates the Healing Hearts Bereavement Group. She helped to develop and publish the Senior Resource Guide, and she teaches a free Senior Resource and Planning Class 101 for seniors and caregivers. Carol DePay is a licensed marriage and family therapist and a graduate of Chapman University. She is the recipient of the 2011 Senior Care Heroes Outstanding Social Worker Award and was also named one of Orange County's 100 Women Making a Difference in 2014. So I think we're in for a real treat. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn this presentation over to our esteemed speaker, Carol DuPay. Good morning. Truly, so nice of all of you to get up this early in the morning um, for the webinar today. I'm actually delighted to have uh, all of you here with me because I, I kind of felt and thought to myself this morning, if I have to get up early, at least there are other people who are doing that with me. So um, I'm glad that you're here. I'm really glad that you're here with me this morning. Today we're going to talk about uh, fall risk reduction. When my friend Beth Yetzer uh, and I began developing this class, we started out by calling it fall prevention. But if you're at all familiar with falls, you know that probably we can't really prevent falls. Um, and so we quickly changed it to fall reduction because it is almost impossible to prevent falls. And in fact, kind of an interesting thing to think about is that Falling is way more complicated and complex than we initially think of uh, about it as being. You know, we, we're, we're so familiar with um, anybody falling, whether it's a child or uh, ourselves or uh, an older adult, we don't think about all of the, um, the dynamics that are involved with uh, falls and what, are, what all of the reasons are. And when you start looking at all of the risk factors, when you start looking at all of the uh, reasons why anyone might fall, then you begin to understand why fall prevention is, in fact, almost impossible to do. But uh, fall reduction is something that we can work on. And I'm particularly, both Beth, Beth and I were particularly interested in uh, working with caregivers because caregivers are probably the most influential when it comes to uh, working with um, uh, a patient or a loved one um, who has the, p the potential for falling. Um, a caregiver is, is the one who is right there and can uh, work with the individual to help ensure that the fall doesn't occur. So um, today we're going to look at uh, a number of different topics having to do with falls. And again, when Beth and I started talking about doing this class, um, it was interesting to both of us uh, how many different topics that there actually were, were involved in uh, the whole concept of falls. 
First of all, we're looking, going to look at the risk factors for falling. We're going to look at some of the causes for falling. Uh, uh, we're going to look at some education and awareness ideas, some tips to prevent falls, safe transfer techniques. This is a particularly important one. Um, so we're going to talk about safe transfer techniques for caregivers, uh, and then how to get up from a fall. So let's go ahead and start. One of the first things to think about is what the impact of falling is on seniors. Um, falls can have a steep financial price tag, uh, too, in the form of costly medical bills. Uh, falls can cause an older adult to lose confidence in, in themselves, when, um, which can lead to isolation uh, and loss of independence, and that often leads to increased um, health problems. It's not a surprise that falls can cause serious injuries. We, 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 we know that. Um, broken bones and, and head injuries, uh, a TBI can, can result, uh, hip fractures. In fact, hip fractures uh, often lead to many other major complications. If, a, if a, an older adult falls uh, in a sideways uh, direction, they can fracture their hip. And when they do, then they may end up in the emergency room, they may end up in the hospital. Oftentimes, there are other complications that, that occur at that point. Um, and another interesting thing, too, is that once an older adult falls, it's not uncommon, uh, depending on what, what their overall health uh, condition is like, it's not uncommon for them to lose their ability to uh, completely recover from, uh, from that fall because, again, there's so many other complications that can arise as a result of the fall. Um, and then one of, the, one of the other interesting things is that, and we don't really think about this, we probably have all had this experience, frankly, but when we fall, one of the things that, that happens with, particularly with older adults, but it, frankly it'll happen with anybody, is that we then experience um, fear that we may fall again. Whoops, Daisy, here we go. So when you, if we, if we fall um, and we develop a fear of falling, which is a relatively common experience for us, when we fall, um, one of the things that happens is that there may be a decrease in our activity level. Um, our muscles and our bones become weaker. There are environmental um, issues uh, around some of the causes for those fears. Uh, previous falls increase the likelihood of future falls. And again, mostly previous falls increase the likelihood of future falls, not because there is anything else that's happening, but because we're so afraid that we're going to do it again, and then in fact, Surprise, surprise, we actually fall again. Um, there are things that we can do to prevent this from happening. We can talk to someone about our fears. We can uh, try and stay active and, and encourage uh, the patient or, the, uh, or our loved one to uh, exercise and keep strong. We can utilize a home safety checklist and build confidence by taking a balance and mobility class. You can talk with your physician about the possibility of physical therapy to improve your balance and mobility. You can consider doing some self-talk uh, to uh, reinforce your self-confidence. And actually, I want to say just a, a few things about self-talk. Um, that's actually a really helpful thing to do. It can be difficult to get in the habit of it, mostly when we do self-talk, and we all engage in self-talk, we, we typically say negative things to ourselves. So you have to kind of like change your mindset. Um, but as a, as a caregiver uh, or a professional, one of the things that you can do with uh, your patients or with your loved one is that you can encourage them to say things to themselves. This is the self-talk part. You can say things to yourself such as, you know what, I have a longer history of staying upright than I have a history of falling. Most of us don't really fall that often. However often that we fall, 
we're more upright, way more upright than we are down on the ground. So remind yourself, I'm, I'm usually just fine, and we need to remind ourselves of that. Or we can say things like, um, I know what I'm doing, and I'm, I'm going to be just fine. Um, there, are, there are a lot of things that we can say in a positive way uh, to remind ourselves, and it's helpful to say things to ourselves like, if I, if I just uh, keep my posture straight, if I watch where I'm going, um, if I do the things that I know that I need to do, I'm going to be just fine. Remind ourselves of that. What are some of the risk factors for falling? And, and again, when um, Beth and I were creating the class, it was kind of surprising to us that there were actually risk factors. I mean, we all know that there are risk factors. We just don't aren't in the habit of identifying some of these risk factors. So today we're going to talk about some of the risk factors um, so that we get a better understanding of what is going on here with falls. One of the reasons that falls are so hard to prevent is that there are so many potential risk factors uh, and causes. Um, most of us don't stop to think about how complicated fall reduction is because falling is really, frankly, such an easy thing for us to do. But the truth is that there are at least four risk factors. There's the biological piece. There is the behavioral piece, the socioeconomic piece. Who would have thought that? And then there is the environmental uh, piece. And all of these contribute to falls. So let's look at these. First of all, we've got the biological piece. And in the biological piece, um, Purely from a biological standpoint, the older that the person is, the more likely that they are to fall. Interestingly, women are more uh, fall more often than men do, and that's probably not a big surprise. Our uh, muscle structure, our bone structure, is a little bit different than men's, and uh, that makes it a little bit easier for us to fall. With age, there are vision problems, there's muscle weakness, there's slower reaction times. Our reflexes uh, are oftentimes uh, not quite as sharp. Um, we can, there can be chronic illness that can cause dizziness or loss of balance. Uh, there are a number of things that happen with, um, with biology. Um, race ends up being uh, an interesting uh, biological factor as well. We know that for reasons that we don't completely understand, African, African Americans are more likely to fall um, people who have, who come from a Hispanic uh, origin, also have. Uh, they're the, in the second highest um, ethnicity uh, to fall, and uh, it, it helps if we are aware of that. The behavioral piece. Um, we tend to be less active, so that's uh, that's right away that takes. Uh, that takes a toll on us because we're less active. Uh, it's not uncommon for older adults to be on medications that can affect balance. Excess alcohol is another piece. When, and, and part of the problem with uh, alcohol is that we may not, as we age, be uh, drinking even as much as we may have um, been doing so when we were younger, but we don't metabolize it as well. And so, uh, Alcohol can often can oftentimes be a, a, a bigger problem than we may uh, think because we don't handle it as well as we age. Uh, let's see. Poor diet affects our strength, um, and not only poor diet affecting our strength, but sometimes one of the problems that uh, happens with older adults is that older adults may forget to eat. That switch can get turned off uh, or we forget when we last ate. That's really what happens is that we forget when we last ate or we, for, we, we lose that um, ability to, to, feel, to feel hunger. And so our diet may be affected. Um, cooking, uh, for one, may be more difficult or we'll, or will eat foods that have, like uh, prepared meals, processed foods that have more salt in them. 
all of these things can impact our not only our balance and mobility, but also our strength and our and uh, our bones. So it's it's interesting how many different things can go into this. Inadequate footwear. That's another problem. Um, it's n it's not uncommon for older adults to um, wear slippers, and slippers are great. We all love slippers, but that can also lead to falls if we're if they're shuffling, if they're not walking uh, well. Another behavioral uh, con uh, concern um, has to do with limited socialization. The less human contact that an older adult has, the higher the likelihood that they're not paying attention to what's going on around them. Uh, socialization turns out to be a huge factor uh, in many health conditions for older adults. And, and to me, that's really just kind of an interesting concept, that socialization would impact my health, but it, but it absolutely can. And along with that comes a decrease in mental activity. Um, oftentimes, uh, older adults are not as mentally active. They were not working. Um, they're, they're not engaged in in activities that uh, may be stimulating or that may be challenging. And so that, that part is reduced. And as a result, um, again, may, people just may not be paying as much attention. So uh, interesting kinds of factors there with uh, both biological and behavioral. But there are a couple of other ones, too. Um, Environmental. This is not a surprise. Uh, this is not any kind of a surprise that clutter is going to be uh, a risk factor. Uh, stairs. And the problem with stairs, there are a lot of problems with stairs, as a matter of fact. People can, because uh, of the f uh, fact that people, as we age, don't always lift our feet like we should for a lot of reasons. Maybe for pain. Uh, maybe our, uh, we don't have the strength. But lifting your feet to go up the stairs um, can be a, a problem, and people will trip because they're simply not lifting their feet enough. Or another problem with stairs is that um, our vision is not always real strong. And because of vision problems and stairs, we don't see stairs in the same way. I take my dog walking every morning, and um, I love my dog. His name is Dylan. Um, Dylan, in the morning, when I go down our stairs, Dylan is older, and he doesn't want to go down those stairs with me uh, because he has got some arthritis. And in the morning, it's hard for him to go down the stairs. But not only that, I know that he's got some cataracts, and he doesn't see as well as he used to see. And you can see, I can see the fear in his eyes. When, he, uh, when I'm trying to drag him down those stairs, he does not want to go because he can't see. Um, so again, stairs end up being um, a, a considerable problem for older adults, and we need to make sure uh, that we're taking precautions around stairs. And we'll talk a little bit more about stairs uh, as we go along. Uh, crowded surroundings. Uh, sometimes we have too much furniture or too many boxes, too many, too many things. Uh, that are in our way. Uh, poor lighting. Oh my goodness, how many times have I been in an older adult's uh, home and been concerned that they have the blinds closed, uh, that the, um, that their, the lights are not um, bright enough. And sometimes that, again, has to do with their own vision problems. Um, the lights, too much lighting may, uh, may cause some, some um, some pain or confusion for, for an older adult when, they're, uh, when that happens. But if we don't have good lighting, then we can't see where we're going. Uh, cracked and unstable surfaces, uh, and that can be in the driveway or on the sidewalk. Uh, loose rugs, trying to um, get someone to pick up their throw rugs is almost impossible, I have learned. Slippery floors, all of those kinds of environmental factors. And again, we're, we'll talk a little bit more about this. Socioeconomic, this one was a little bit of a surprise to me because uh, I wouldn't have thought that it would make a difference how much money that an individual makes. But it turns out that um, people who have a lower uh, income level also are likely to have 
more uh, or have uh, limited social activities. They're not as likely to be able to afford to do certain things. Uh, and even if they can afford free opportunities, they may not be in the habit of thinking about um, taking advantage of these opportunities. Oftentimes, people who have um, to live on a lower income level have limited access to health services. I see that. That's one of the things that I see here at St. Jude on a regular basis, that people uh, on a, with a lower income level have limited access to health services, such as, for instance, dental um, health. Uh, Medicare doesn't really offer much in the way of dental um, protection. And that can lead, oral hygiene problems can lead to many other problems for seniors. Again, these are things that we don't typically associate with fall risk, but it turns out that everything is connected. Uh, another socioeconomic problem uh, has to do with uh, transportation. Oftentimes, people who, who are in a lower socioeconomic um, area, and this doesn't necessarily, even if you have enough money, um, transportation can still be a problem, and it often is the case. So then there may be limited access to uh, the senior center, and these are free places, uh, to church, going shopping, all of those kinds of activities uh, can be limited uh, by transportation or having limited access. Uh, the last one is uh, lack of community resources um, or access, again, to these community resources. In a, in a lower socioeconomic level, um, resources end up being a concern, and uh, that's not, it's not uncommon for that to be uh, a problem that we wouldn't normally think of with uh, fall risk reduction. So the next thing that we're going to talk about are what some of the reasons are why a fall may occur. And again, um, this, is, this is an area that we don't typically stop to think about. But there are actually a lot of reasons why a fall can occur. And it helps if we know what these reasons are, because that's when we can begin to understand uh, how we can reduce falls. Um, again, we've talked about some of these already. Clutter, tripping hazards, poor lighting, misjudgment, um, poor vision, muscle weakness, shuffling, medication issues, poor hydration. Our reaction time slows down uh, when, as we get older. Uh, reflexes are just simply not as fast. We just, we just don't respond as quickly. Medication interactions um, or inaccurate dosage amounts uh, may cause lightheadedness or dizziness, uh, or it can even impact vision. And, the, and again, these are things that we don't always take into account. We don't always factor those kinds of things um, into the whole fall risk. We just, we may notice these, uh, that we feel lightheaded when we stand up. We may notice that um, we, there is some muscle weakness or some bone uh, kinds of issues, but we don't necessarily think about those automatically in terms of a fall risk reduction. Another problem that is uh, associated with fall risk reduction or with fall risk has to do with uh, hydration. Oftentimes, older adults have a hard time staying hydrated, uh, and dehydration is the cause of more falls than you may possibly even imagine. Um, when, when I hear about uh, an older adult coming into the emergency room for any, for any reason, the first thing, the, literally the very first thing that I think about is that there's dehydration. Or if I hear that uh, an older adult has fallen, whatever other uh, causes that there might be, my first uh, inclination is to suspect that there is dehydration that's going on. Remember what I was saying about the fact that as we age, it's not uncommon for uh, us to lose the ability to uh, sense hunger. Well, the same goes for uh, thirst. And um, staying hydrated for an older adult is much more difficult. For one thing, we're just simply not as active as we age. And because we're not as active, we don't automatically think about drinking uh, fluids. Uh, our electrolytes, uh, di because of our diet, uh, our electrolytes are uh, oftentimes in question. And when we don't get those electrolytes, 
we may cramp up, we may uh, get uh, lightheaded or, or dizzy. Um, we just, and we also, dehydration um, prevents us from thinking as clearly. Uh, so I, I really, I cannot emphasize how important it is to make sure, to ensure that older adults are staying hydrated, that they're drinking as much as they can. I'm going to take a second right now and I'm going to have a swallow of water because this is another thing that happens with older adults. They lose contact with other human beings. And, and because they aren't in contact with, with other human beings nearly to the same um, uh, ratio that you and I might be at this point in our lives, they're not talking as much. And when they don't talk as much, they also don't um, have that same level of thirst. So I'm going to take a little drink of water right now, and I encourage you to do the same thing. So I'm going to take one second here. I am fortunate because I love water. And I took, um, I was only going to take one swallow because I truly do love water. I took a couple swallows of water. Um, and it just makes an instant difference. So uh, one of the reasons why our older adults may fall is a huge reason has to do with dehydration. So please make sure that you're aware of that and that you're encouraging um, the senior that you may work with or that you may know uh, to stay hydrated. Another thing that we thought about uh, when we were developing the class is all of the different fall prevention categories. So there's balance and mobility, lifestyle modifications, home safety, awareness, just simply awareness and education. We wanted to make sure that you know the kinds of things that you can do, and then some tips and strategies to prevent and reduce falls. First thing that we're going to talk about today is balance and mobility. One of the benefits of a balance and mobility program is that it also actually addresses the fear of falling that many seniors experience. Um, balance and, and balance and mobility uh, programs are available in virtually any senior center. That's one of the things that they are very much aware of uh, in senior centers, and there are excellent classes uh, available. You can also attend exercise classes. Uh, you can do strength training, uh, take a yoga or a tai chi class. Uh, Office on Aging offers a class called Matter of Balance, and these are all free classes, so these are available. And, they, and they're available on a rotating basis, so they're available almost all of the time. You want to encourage the use of canes or walkers if they're needed. Most of us are not real enthusiastic when we first start using a cane or a walker about using them because, frankly, they make us look old. And nobody wants to look old or to feel old. Um, so it, it may take um, a little bit of persuasion. Uh, I encourage older adults, if you need it, have more than one walker at home. Maybe have one uh, in the car have one that you have in your bedroom so that when you get up in the middle of the night and you go to uh, the restroom, you have one that is right there by your bed. You'd be surprised how many people fall getting from their bed to their walker. So it's really important to keep it right there by your bed. But then if there are stairs involved, then you're going to want another walker downstairs. You're certainly not going to carry it up and down stairs. So if you, if you need a walker, if the older adult that you, um, that you work with or that you um, live with needs a walker, make sure that they have them close by uh, at all times and encourage them to use it. Um, we've already talked about the balance and mobility classes. And, and we also encourage people to walk more often and walk further when at all possible walk often, and walk further. Additionally, with balance and mobility, uh, a good rule of thumb is to get up and move every hour on the hour. It's good for your metabolism, it's good for your circulation, and it's good for your balance. 
It's also good for mental acuity. Uh, getting up um, and moving on the hour, that increases our ability to be alert. Uh, and it's, a, it's a, an excellent habit for anyone of any age uh, to get into the habit of doing. Get up and move on the hour every hour. I can't tell you that I, am, that I always do that. In fact, too many times I find myself sitting at my desk glued to my computer screen. Uh, and it, it's something that I, that I need to work on, on as well. Um, but I know the benefits of doing that. So walk more often and walk further if possible. Lifestyle modifications. Oh my goodness. This is probably the most difficult. It, it may, it's not necessarily difficult. The, the, the tasks involved are not necessarily difficult. But it turns out that most of us are not that good at making changes in our lifestyle. Um, we, just, we just don't do it. We, we may know what we need to do. Um, we may think about it, but actually following through takes a little bit of doing for us. So uh, lifestyle modifications that you can make um, have to do with looking at your current health conditions and keeping that in mind and, and uh, noticing the kinds of changes that you might need to make there. Uh, making sure that we get regular vision and, and hearing checkups. Uh, medication side effects. Talk with your physician. Talk with your pharmacist. I actually prefer pharmacists because pharma it, that with a pharmacist, you know that they're not only totally unbiased, but this is their job. Their Everything that they have learned, all of their training, all of their experience has to do with medication. And your physician, um, while of course they are very well informed and, and they know exactly also what, is, what uh, the side effects are, they have a lot of things that are going on for them. But your pharmacist, uh, that's precisely what they're all about. And they, also, and they have no bias. Um, they're just giving you straight information. So I encourage people to talk with their pharmacist about uh, medication side effects, um, about medication interactions, all of those kinds of things. Lifestyle modifications include diet. We've already talked about um, making sure that we're staying hydrated, that we are eating a healthy diet, and that includes, of course, plenty of fruits and vegetables. Whatever is good for your heart is also good for your brain. Um, modifications. Um, involve things like risk taking, and you may, and that can go up or down. I oftentimes encourage people to take the kinds of risks that they can safely um, follow through on. There are some risks that are a good thing for us to do. As we age, oftentimes people slow down on taking risks, and again, that can reduce both reaction, our ability to be reactive, and, it, and our reflexes slow down, and it can also reduce, uh, reduce our mental acuity. So certainly not wanting anybody to take a risk that would be, um, that would be harmful or involve a, sa a safety issue that they're unprepared to take, but risk taking could be something like um, uh, even light things having to do with socialization, uh, that they reach out and talk with someone, make a telephone call, that they um, sit next to somebody different at, at church, um, that they uh, take a walk around the block, and that they, in that walk, that they're thinking about all of the things that they need to be doing, uh, such as using a cane or a walker, making sure that they are looking where they're going, all those things really can be a risk for seniors and they may not want to do it. Making changes in your living environment to increase safety. That's another modification that is oftentimes something that people don't want to actually do. Consider how your time is spent. And modify that as necessary. The next piece seems like it would be automatic and that is talking to your doctor, talking to your doctor or going to the emergency room. But believe it or not, most of us and most of the seniors that we uh, work with and that we know do not either automatically go to the emergency room or talk to their doctor about uh, a fall that they've had. 
And, and at this point, let me just ask any of you to think about a recent fall that you have had. Um, just full disclosure, I fell about, mm, let's see, I'm thinking it was about a week or so ago, maybe a little bit less than that. And um, uh, and it was, you know, it probably, I don't know if it was preventable or not, but I was out walking uh, the dogs early in the morning. I, I get up early and I'm out walking and it wasn't real light. And I what I did was I stepped in a, in a hole in the ground. I was on uh, some uneven ground and <laughs> it was dark and I had the two dogs on the leash and I just stepped right in a hole, didn't see it, fell flat on my, I was totally surprised too. I, <laughs> I kind of chuckled at myself because I was totally surprised at uh, having fallen like that. Not planning on that, not anticipating it. And I got up from the fall and kept on walking. But a couple of things that I noticed when I, when I fell. One was that, so about a year and a half or two years ago, I had both a hip and a knee replacement. And so getting back up for me was not an easy thing uh, to do. I, I could do it, and I did it. It wasn't a big problem, but it was something that I was aware of. I was, it wasn't the same as when I was 14. It wasn't the same as when I was 37. Getting back up as we age turns out to be a little bit more difficult. Uh, and I also noticed another thing. I went in for my annual checkup yesterday. So it was just yesterday. I went in for my uh, annual checkup yesterday, and guess what? I did not mention the fall that I would had to my physician, although that would have been a likely thing for me to have done. And it's something that I encourage um, the older adults that I work with to make sure that they're doing, and yet I didn't do it. I didn't even think about it, frankly. Um, there were no injuries or, or whatever, but you never know. And that's why it is a good idea to make sure that our seniors are talking to their physician about any falls that they might have had. To, because there are all kinds of reasons, as we've already discussed, for a fall to occur. So make sure that they discuss any injuries or any falls that they have. If they need to go to the emergency room, it's a good idea, particularly if they have um, hit their head or if they've landed in a way that uh, may have twisted, they may have twisted and, and caused some, some kind of pain for themselves. It's a good idea when you go to your doctor, have a list of questions that you want to ask. If I don't write it out, I'm not likely to ask the question. You get in there and you get talking about different things and you get distracted and you forget to ask questions. Personally, what I like to encourage people to do, not only write out your questions in advance, but give those questions to your physician and ask your physician to write the answers down for you. That way, you don't have to take the time to write the answers down. You're not missing anything. And the physician has a clearer understanding of the things that are really um, concerning for you. So take in a list of questions. Discuss any problems that you're going to have or that you may be having. Any symptoms that um, have popped up since your last visit. Do a good, solid medication review. Your physician is going to be good about doing that with you. But this is your opportunity to really look at any side effects or the dosages that you're on, those kinds of things. You can ask for some advice on how to, how to reduce um, the risk of fault. Uh, if, you're, if your physician um, uh, suggests it, you may, you're, you may um, change some of your medications. Uh, you can look at some of the risk factors with your doctor, and your doctor can actually either, he can do one of uh, two things, he or she can do one of two things. He can do a, a fall risk assessment right there in the office with you, or she may uh, order a fall risk uh, assessment in your home uh, through home health. So make sure that you are going to the emergency room if you need to, or if your older adult needs to, and that you are talking with your physician at your next visit. Home safety. So again, these are things that we um, have talked about to some extent. You can see that stairs, and this is the first thing that, that I wanted to mention, how stairs look uh, for people with aging vision. When there is, and you really, it doesn't even necessarily have, have anything to do with um, aging. It can just be anybody with vision issues. Uh, you may see, where there, is the, where there is the next rung on the step, or you might not. If they have 
put a white stripe on there or a different color uh, on, on the stair, then it makes it a little bit easier uh, to be able to see. I encourage people to put handrails in their bathrooms, uh, to pick up the, 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 uh, the throw rugs. Another good thing is to have, have a personal fall alert system. And when you're looking at fall alert systems, um, there, there are a number of them out on the market. Uh, and fall alert systems can be a really important thing to have. I would encourage you to get ones that have a GPS on them so that you can take them outside of the home as well. Awareness and education. Again, I would uh, encourage all of you to use uh, handrails and to encourage your seniors to use uh, canes and walkers if they need them. Uh, and, and here I'm going to um, suggest too that you encourage your older adults to stand with a tall posture. If you're sitting down right now, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> I'm going to take a drink of my water. Um, if you're sitting down right now, you can do this right now. Sit with a tall posture. And what I'd like for you to do while you're sitting right now and listening to me talk, look at your eye level at a target right ahead of you. And that may be just a few feet ahead of you. But when you look at a target straight ahead of you, what you're doing is you're keeping yourself in a, not only in a tall posture, but you are uh, not looking down as you walk. We do want you to look ahead but not necessarily down as you walk, because you're going to increase the likelihood of falls. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Sometimes when I'm talking, I swallow and talk at the same time. It's not a good idea. <coughs> I encourage a heel-to-toe stride. So do that right now, too. Put your heel down first, and then your toe. Heel-to-toe. heel to toe. heel to toe, <laughs> best way to walk. <coughs> oh, sorry. Check for dizziness. So when older adults get up from a sitting position or lie down, they're often dizzy. Something that you can encourage them to do, and again, I encourage you to do this right now. Practice this with me. Um, shake, have them shake their feet before they stand up. So shake your feet right now. Just shake them, shake them, shake them. Um, that encourages uh, circulation. That encourages, that triggers mental activity. <clears throat> and uh, that alertness uh, is one of the important things that people can do to help pr uh, pr uh, prevent falls. So shake your feet. But another thing you can do are little kinds of fun things, like you can draw the ABCs uh, with your feet. Um, and so practice it right now. If you practice it, and if you do it, you're much more likely to convey this to the older adults. So practice drawing the ABCs with your feet. And again, what you're doing is you are uh, increasing that, that uh, blood flow, that circulation, your metabolism, all those things. And you're also helping to keep down that, uh, the likelihood of dizziness. Point your toes uh, and bring them back to your nose. Point your toes, bring them back to your nose. I know it sounds silly, but it really can make a difference on a lot of different levels. So awareness and education. Transfer techniques. Older adults should shift forward in their seat uh, and make sure that their feet are solidly on the floor before they stand up. Uh, you want to have your older adult lean slightly forward. And these are instructions that I would encourage you to give verbally. So when you're working with an older adult and you're wanting them to stand up from a seated position and you are going to transfer them either to a walker or you're going to transfer them to a wheelchair, these are verbal instructions that you can give them. And it helps a lot if, if you are telling them exactly this is what I need for you to do. I want you to sit up straight. When we sit up straight, then we engage our back muscles, and that immediately makes us uh, a little bit stronger just by simply engaging our back muscles. But verbally describe to the patient what the next steps will be uh, in, the, in the transfer, in that whole transfer process. And then 
make sure that you are not uh, doing something that will be safe in that transfer process. If you're not capable of helping them physically, don't do it. Please, for your sake and for the sake of your patient, your loved one, um, don't engage physically if there could be any kind of a safety concern. Getting up from a fall. So I've just done this myself, like I've told you. Um, and I can tell you that one of the first things to make sure that you are doing is to calm down, catch your breath, and compose yourself after the shock, because it is a shock. It's a shock after you fall down. Check your body for injury. These are, these are things that you probably will do just automatically, but you might not. You might get up too fast. Uh, you might not give yourself a chance to catch your breath and compose yourself. It makes a big difference. Sometimes we get embarrassed when we fall, and we don't do those things. It's to our advantage to make sure that we're doing these things. I'm not going to go through this whole list of getting up from a fall. <clears throat> Turns out that some of these uh, techniques are, are almost instinctual. Uh, but it, again, it helps. If, if you are the one that is working with um, the older adult with the fall, it helps them to have you go through these instructions verbally. It gives them some, uh, something to focus on, something to concentrate on. Make sure that they are always resting in between movements. Make sure if they do that, they're much more likely to be successful in that whole process. We're at the end here of our, uh, of our webinar and of the class. And this is when we start looking at uh, the summary. So listing two causes of falls. Uh, so in your own head, you can think about what, what at least two causes of, of falls might have been. Um, I'll give you a chance to just think for a second. But it could be things like medication interactions, uh, uneven, uneven pavement, or like for me, it was, it was, uh, there was a hole in the ground that I just didn't see. Uh, and, th and that easily happens. It can be clutter. That's another easy thing. Uh, and of course, my biggest bugaboo, as you may know, is dehydration. Dehydration is a cause for many serious, serious problems. People end up dying from dehydration, <clears throat> from the causes of dehydration. Uh, second one, state three fall prevention strategies or tips. Well, we've talked about a lot of things. Um, balance and mobility classes, exercise, good posture. Okay, straighten up right now while, while, while we're talking about good posture and the, and the difference that that makes. Straighten up your back right there. A healthy diet. Uh, regular medical checkups. State two safety techniques to help with a transfer. You can verbally describe to the older adult what the next steps are going to be. You can have them sit up straight in a chair. Make sure that they are shifting their weight forward. Just that, rather than immediately standing up, shift your weight forward. And those verbal instructions can make a big difference too. Describing how to get up from a fall. We didn't go into a lot of detail on, on that, but there is significant detail um, in the handout. And I encourage you to go over the uh, uh, description of how to get up from a fall. So I want to thank you very much for attending this caregiver fall reduction class. Um, I am thinking that if there are any questions that Kim may um, ask. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Uh, just as a reminder every, to everyone, you have to stay logged on for a full 60 minutes uh, uh, to get your CEs. And so let's go to the question and answer and see uh, what we have here from the audience. So uh, we have a question. Well, first of all, real quick, Carol, one of our attendees wants to know if Beth Yetzer worked at the VA hospital in Long Beach. I'm sorry? <laughs> Oh, yes, definitely. Okay, good. Well, I'll connect you with that attendee later then uh, to talk okay. about that. But this Beth is a is great a question. Who worked at, okay. the, at uh, the Long Beach uh, Veterans uh, Hospital for many years. I adore Wonderful. Beth, by the way. So. Wonderful. Uh, so someone's asking, can home care companies incorporate this information into their fall training? That's a 
the quick answer is home care companies are one of the reasons that Beth and I developed this class. Um, and we would be so happy to offer this class to home care companies uh, as a training for their caregivers. So the short answer is yes. We'd love to offer this class to home care companies. Okay, good. Thank you, Carol. And then um, another question is, where could you find someone to come to your home to do a fall risk assessment? And I want to tack on to that question. Is, there, uh, is that covered by Medicare or HMOs? So is there someone that can come out and do that? And is it covered? So uh, the, again, the short answer is, is yes. Uh, yes, it is likely to be covered for a number of reasons. There, um, if your physician orders it through home health, then an, uh, an either an occupational therapist or a physical therapist will come out to your home, and it is something that would be covered uh, because it's a prescription, um, and your physician can, can offer that. But having said that, um, that's something that, can, that many agencies will offer. So home care agencies also typically offer a uh, fall risk uh, uh, assessment. Um, just as a regular practice. It's something that we do here at St. Jude, but many, many agencies will offer it, and it's almost always a free assessment because we want to prevent falls. We want to make sure that you're not going to the hospital. So I hope that answers your question. If anybody is looking for a fall risk assessment um, option, um, they can get in touch with me and I can give them some suggestions. <coughs> Great. And then um, another great question uh, is, should walking aids, you talked about the use of walkers and canes, et cetera, and how important that is. Should they be especially fitted to the individual, or is any type of walking aid okay? A hundred percent of the time, they should be fitted to the individual. That can be one of the um, reasons for a fall is if you don't have uh, a correct fitting or the best cane. There are, for instance, there are, are three-pronged canes that you might use, but maybe you don't need that. Um, that will give you added stability, <clears throat> but maybe you don't need that. Even the height and the length of, uh, of the cane or the walker needs to be fitted specifically to the individual. I'm glad that they asked that question. It's a really great question. Great, um, and one more question. Um, are there particular types of shoes that can either uh, increase or decrease the risk of falls. I know you talked about slippers, but I'm just wondering if there are any other recommendations you want to make around uh, shoes. What a great question. I, I'm surprised that uh, Beth and I didn't uh, address that issue, but uh, that's another really good, good idea. And by the way, when I fell, I was wearing flip-flops. So <laughs> not Carol, a that's... I think that's <laughs> not a good I, I'm idea. I'm just recalling to wear. that someone told me that wearing flip flops is like the worst. Yeah, exactly. And I wear exactly. them all the time. <laughs> and do I teach that class? Oh my goodness! Uh, that just shows you that all of us can uh, uh, can at times be a little uh, reckless and and not thinking clearly. But at any rate, um, shoes that have got good good uh, tread on them, um, shoes that are are uh, close fitting, not tight fitting, but at least close fitting, closed toed shoes uh, are a better option for us. We're more likely to uh, not fall or to be able to recover from a fall if we have a closed toed shoe. Uh, so yes, definitely something that's got some, some traction on it is, it is a good idea for uh, shoes. And thanks for that suggestion. Maybe I'll incorporate that. <laughs> okay. Um, at this time, we have reached the end of our webinar. Uh, I do want to thank our speaker, Carol Dupay, so much uh, for this information. We're really grateful for your time and for sharing this important uh, information, and we appreciate your expertise uh, in this area. And so, can I just say, uh, it was really great talking um, with all of you this morning. Uh, I encourage you to practice some of these strategies yourself. It'll be easier to teach others if you do some of these things on your own. But beware, I was practicing the toe to nose and I banged my knee on my desk. So <laughs> make sure you stay safe when you're practicing these techniques. 
Uh, Carol, again, we thank you so much. And for everyone on the line, please watch for the eval. It's going to be sent to you immediately after the presentation. It may pop up on your screen, in fact, as you disconnect. Uh, next uh, webinar is going to be awesome. Uh, we uh, will have Carol Dupay, and she is a licensed clinical social worker who is the Director of Family Services here at Alzheimer's Orange County with a very impressive background in elder abuse. And so her topic will be financial exploitation and elder abuse, why people with dementia are especially vulnerable. So we hope to see you then. Uh, that's Friday, May 4th uh, at 7.30 a.m. And uh, if you're interested in other educational op opportunities or want to learn more about upcoming webinars, you're invited to go onto our website, www.alzoc.org, to see what's coming up. Thank you all for participating, and have a wonderful day.